Geopolitics and spaceflight are often at odds with each other, but perhaps never more so than now, with huge sanctions placed on Russia due to the Ukraine war, and yet NASA and Roscosmos are continuing to work together. So today we welcome back author Stephen Walker, who has just recently published an article in The Guardian on the current relationship between the two. We love hearing from you, so please let us know what you think. You can do this via our social media pages at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram, Threads, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us at patreon.com forward slash Space and Things. But right now, enjoy episode 163 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. This is the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 163 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Looking forward to my holiday. I've got another holiday coming up. but Awesome. More on that another time. Yeah. Let's get on with uh, this week's main feature. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'll know that we've had Stephen Walker on here a few times. Firstly, way back at episode 32 to talk about his book Beyond, which is the incredible story of Yuri Gagarin's first spaceflight. We then had him back on on episode 49 to talk about the second cosmonaut, Germain Titov, and then episode 65 to talk about the start of sending animals into space. So we've wanted to have Stephen back on ever since, but scheduling hasn't been easy. And now we've finally got him back. And this is a very interesting and topical topic. Yes. As some of you may know, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this later, there has been another leak on the ISS. So it feels appropriate to be talking about this anyway. Absolutely. So at the end of August, Stephen had an article published in the Guardian newspaper, which he had spent months researching. It's about life on the space station at a time of war. Since Russia invaded Ukraine at the start of 2022, Western governments have been imposing sanctions on Russia in almost every way they can. In spaceflight, we've seen future science missions canceled and Western companies and space agencies have canceled any contracts they've had with Roscosmos the uh, Russian agency, to deliver cargo. The one exception to this has been the International Space Station, which in November is celebrating its 25th birthday. Yep. So today we're going to talk to Stephen about his research and why the ISS has remained neutral at this time of war. Greetings, Earthling. We interrupt your regular programming to bring you an important message. It's time to crack on. All right. So hello, Stephen, and thank you for joining us again. It's good to have you back. So let's get a bit of background first. The early days of the space race had the U.S. and the Soviet Union pitted against each other, but that culminated in the Apollo-Soyuz mission in 1975, which saw the two collaborate for the first time. So how did the fall of the Soviet Union shape spaceflight through the 90s in the first two decades of the 21st century? Well, it's a very interesting question because what was really happening by the late 1980s, the Russians obviously had, or the Soviets had, space station Mir, which was a pretty extraordinary, a pretty remarkable technological feat in its own right, actually. And in many respects, they were way ahead in space station technology, way ahead of Mm -hmm. the United States, which in some ways had kind of lost its way you could argue, in the space race, as it were, by that point. I mean, after Apollo, we know there was Apollo Soyuz, you just mentioned it, in 1975. And there was Skylab, there were all these different things happening, but there was a sense in which the drama, the excitement that had animated space in the 1960s, which of course I first wrote about in my book in 1961, that was sort of disappearing. The Russians were good at space stations. They were good at space stations. They had about seven, I think, space stations by the time we get to the collapse in the Soviet Union. And famously, there was the cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev, who was stuck up in space on the Mir space station at the time when the USSR completely collapsed beneath them and turned into Russia. And it was a big question at that time about whether he was even going to get back to Earth and in what capacity and who was actually going to do all of that. So what you have is a situation where you've got the space station technology in Russia at that time is quite impressive. In the United States, 
there comes a move in the 1980s, which is really sponsored by Ronald Reagan at a time of heightened tension in the Cold War to build an American space station. And predictably, he gives the name freedom to that space <laughs> station. It was all of that period where it was all about the kind of the importance of manifesting a sort of freedom, liberty, destiny that was America's destiny in the world. And all of that is happening at that time. And at the time, also, there was a decision to try and bring Europeans into this and possibly to bring the Canadians and the Japanese into this as well. But the problem is that even though it looks good on paper, there was a real question about funding it. The will, as I say, was not really behind it. What's the point of a space station? Do we actually need it? Can we really afford it? All of those sorts of things. And you get to the point where the Soviet Union has collapsed. This idea of a space station in America is sort of not really getting anywhere. There isn't really the funding. There isn't really the willpower behind it. And there comes a point in the early 1990s when an opportunity is seized. It's actually seized ultimately by President Clinton. And the seizing is that you join these two countries in space together. You actually join in the creation of an international space station, a space station that will involve the Russians who've got the know-how, the technology, they've got Mir behind them, they've got seven space stations behind them and American know-how and money, and you bring these things together and you build the world's first truly international space station. And that's what starts to happen in the 1990s. So let's discuss your latest article that was published in The Guardian about the ISS during the Ukraine war. So who did you try to talk to for this and how did the interviewees feel about discussing this issue? Like, you know, was there any hesitation or anything like that? I was called up by the deputy editor of the Guardian magazine to see if it was possible, this was I think in April of this year, to see if it was possible to write a piece about what on earth is going on up there right now. What is it like to have Russians and Americans living in close proximity, basically in a sort of tin can, the size of a six bedroom house orbiting the earth 16 times a day and stuck up there, not just for months, but in some cases for a year together while this war is taking place on the ground. And at the same time, the question also arose, which is the big question, namely, is this something that we should be doing? What on earth are we doing collaborating, we being the West, if you like, the United States, Western nations, obviously the United Kingdom. What are we doing collaborating with Russia? Why are we in this International Space Station at all? And that was a really big question because it's a moral question. Every single other space venture, joint space venture between Russia and the West has been cancelled. ExoMars has been cancelled. Lunar project has been cancelled. I mean, all of these projects have been cancelled. And some, the Russians had exited themselves from, like the Artemis program, they already pulled themselves out from. So you have a situation in which there is this one remaining thing that is up there that is still a joint venture, that still has Russian money, that still has American money and Western money and know-how, that there's still a joining, there's still an interaction. Indeed, there are still NASA personnel working in Moscow, in Russia, as there are personnel from Roscosmos, which is the Russian space agency working in the United States. How could this be mm. in the light of the war that's taking place on the ground? How could this be? So there was an issue about, don't mention the war, what happens when you actually live together? How do you live together without tearing each other's eyes out, getting into terrible rows up there, and there's kind of blood on the walls when there's literally nowhere to go? You can't take a walk unless mm -hmm. it's a space walk. You can't <laughs> go anywhere, right? You're stuck and stuck for months and months and months. But at the same time, it's what is the moral position here? How do we justify this in a time of war? So to do that, I started... I said, look, I don't know if this is possible to do or not, but I started to put my feelers out, some of which were through you guys, actually, to get to speak to people. A lot of people said to me, this is going to be impossible. You will never reach people who will talk to you. Inside NASA, they won't talk to you. Inside the European Space Agency, they won't talk to you. And they certainly won't talk to you in Russia, because where do you even begin? But I had a lot of Russian contacts, and I had some great contacts on the American side. 
And I love a challenge. <laughs> and when everybody says you can't do something, that means you've got to try and do it. That yeah. to me is is the red rag to the bull moment. And I thought, sod this, I'm going to give this a go. And so I did. And it took an inordinately long amount of time. I unfortunately had other things to get on with, but it was really delicate and difficult, step by step, beginning to get in touch with American astronauts, Canadian astronauts, other people that would start to talk to me, and then eventually even to get to speak to Russians as well. So out of that, I was able to construct, I hope, not only answers to the question, how is it that we're doing this? What is the kind of moral justification for the space station and all of our partners being part of it at all? But also the big question of what the hell is it like? Yeah. Reading the article, I mean, the article is wonderful, uh, but the, the thing that really strikes me is the element of hope that exists within all of this. There's also the poignancy of that. Is this the last time this will ever happen? Yeah. It, yeah. Will something like this ever be able to happen again? It's really quite a big subject, isn't it? It's quite something that it even really exists at all. Clinton, as you said earlier, really did go for it at that point and, and took that opportunity. And the fact that we've had, we're coming up to 25 years, we had all that time where they were working absolutely fine, and they still are working fine, but where, where there wasn't too many conflicts that between the yeah. two, it's really yeah. quite something, isn't it? There is a great sadness, and there is a great poignancy. You're absolutely right. I mean, you're talking about what is space for? Is it for conflict? Is it for war? Or is it for peace? What is space actually for? That's what it really kind of comes yeah. down to. When you look at what happens in the 1960s, the race to put the first person in space is really ultimately about who, as Lyndon Johnson, later to become president, famously says, famously says, whoever controls space controls the world. That's what Lyndon Johnson said, okay? The man that took America essentially into Vietnam. So what you've got is a discussion, which is much more than a discussion. It becomes a quite passionate point about what are we doing this for? Yeah. What is it for? And what is our common humanity that is taking us beyond our borders and into the beyond, into space? So what we have with the International Space Station is, yes, hard politics. Let's get very clear. Clinton made those decisions, not just simply through some kind of idealism, but through opportunism. There was money that they didn't have, which the Russian know-how would mean they wouldn't have to spend because a hell of a lot of that work was already done, which the Russians could bring to the table. There was also a real fear at the time, I mean, a continuing fear, actually, that these Russian engineers and scientists, if they were not drawn into the International Space Station program, would end up being paid by North Korea or Iran to go and build missiles, which would be obviously a threat against the West. So there were some practical opportunistic hard politics involved, reasons why Clinton did what he did. But there's something kind of beautiful in it as well. The beauty of the idea that, that nations which had been either actually at war or in cold warfare with each other could come together, not just with a kind of publicity stunt like Apollo Soyuz arguably was in 1975, but something much more permanent that would benefit all of humankind and take us on this great adventure together in our common humanity into space. That's really what this was kind of about. And that has been severely dented. The fact that it, it was really difficult for me to kind of reach people or that people were very wary of talking to me is proof of that. They were wary of talking to me on the Russian side because, because they've been monitored, because they could just disappear literally overnight. I mean, people were very frightened. And a lot of the American astronauts that I finally spoke to have given up talking to their Russian cosmonaut friends. Many people that they trained with, they learned Russian, they spent time in Star City, they traveled on Russian rockets to the space station where they lived on the mm. space station with these people. And yet they're too frightened to call them up, either because they might get them into trouble or because maybe these people have changed and politically they've become very hard line. And what do you then talk about? So very difficult to get people to open up. But that sense of what could have been, what was and what still maybe, just maybe after Putin, after all this is over, what maybe, what just might be still 
that fire is has not completely gone out and it's kind of beautiful to hear yeah and and i think that's highlighted in the article when you spoke to alexander mizurkin the, the one is, is it the one cosmonaut you managed to speak to is that right yeah i mean the, i tell you the honest truth of that the fact is, i can't say how i was how i got to that to alexander because i know it's going to anybody but I got there through a friend of a friend of a contact of a friend. <laughs> right, was that one of those things? Anyway, I realised that politics was off the table. It would, there'd be no service in that. And if I tried to talk politics, I could get him into trouble. I have to say, Alexander did actually then offer to start talking to other people on my behalf and get them to speak to me as well. But I had conversations with very key contacts of mine who know the kind of inside world and know Russia very well from the inside. And they advised me not to. Uh, this is not something I said in the Guardian piece, actually. Uh, so I'm saying it for the first time publicly now. They advised me not to. Mm. And they advised me not to because, not just because I might get them into trouble, but I might get Alexander into trouble. Wow. And I didn't want to go down that route. Look, nobody in the cosmonaut corps has spoken out against the war. Sorry, one cosmonaut, Gennady Badalka, the guy that's, famous for spending more time in space than anybody. I think, well, anybody in the space station, I think he spent over nearly 900 days in space. I think it is the world record. Everybody loves this guy on the Western side that I spoke to. He's just an absolute joy. And all kinds of people I spoke to reinforced that point over and over again. Gennady Padalka, I think, and I mentioned this, I think somewhere in the piece, about a week or two after the invasion, which is in February, obviously, of 2022, did write a very mild piece uh, in a now banned newspaper where he suggested that, you know, implied that the bombing of civilians was not what he was trained as a Russian pilot once to do. In other words, implying this is not something we should be doing. We should, you know, with military targets, not civilian targets. And he's never spoken out since. The mm. newspaper's been banned. All of its editors have either gone into hiding or they've left the country. And there's no more statements from Padalka at all. You just don't dare speak out. You just don't. I contacted the Russian embassy in London. I have a fantastically good relationship with the Russian ambassador here. When I published Beyond, I was invited to a caviar and vodka launch party <laughs> at the Russian residence in London. Wow. wow. Which was astonishing. <laughs> I mean, piles of caviar, piles of, of, of <laughs> champagne and vodka, and the entire Russian press, a lot of this stuff is on YouTube. And that happened when the book was published, which was whenever it was, April, May 2021, a long time ago now. He was a first port of call. I said, I need to talk to people inside Russia. I must have written to him and to his press assistant four times. No response. Nothing. Wow. Wow. That's that's something, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's the, the, the thing, and it ties in the last two questions, is that quote f that you have from Alexander that you just have to read through the lines after he talked to you about the, 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 Luke, the um, Lucas spacewalk um, Luca Palmiotano, who nearly had a disaster in his spacewalk. And the, and the quote was, uh, thank God he lived. I don't know if the International Space Station is a symbol or not, but I do know for sure it's the best example of how we should all behave on the ground. And and it it's as close as you get to uh, to someone in Russia saying, this is good, isn't yes, it? Yes, really? I know. I've, I actually recorded the Zoom conversation where he said this. I haven't envisioned saying it. With his permission. And it was, uh, I mean, he was close to tears. I mean, actually, I think he really was just about in tears. I mean, it really, really matters to these people. I mean, these are people who have dedicated their careers to space. That's what they do. They face these dangers together. And there are some really big dangers up there. We, you know, we've discussed this sort of thing before, I think, talking about Yuri Gagarin and all that in the past. But the day, space is still dangerous. As Charlie Bolden, the ex-NASA administrator, said to me, I mean, it's difficult stuff up there. Space is hard. It's really hard. And you've got everything going on. You've got radiation issues. You've got micrometeorite debris happening. Lots more of it with each passing year, as we know. You know, you've got things that go wrong, particularly Russian things that go wrong, because 
a consequence of sanctions and other problems and brain drains means that there's a lot of Russian hardware that isn't working properly. Yeah. And there's been a lot of kind of near misses in the last couple of years, which are terribly serious, actually. So space is very, very dangerous. And so these guys share these dangers together. They have to, because you're dead if you don't work together as a team. <laughs> yeah. You have to. So for them, this war and this rage and this terrible scar is the worst thing that could ever happen. I mean, listen, in the bigger picture, the worst thing that ever happens is what's happening to Ukrainians on the ground, obviously. But it has a terribly marked effect on a dream that has sort of turned into a nightmare. Okay, we've talked a little bit about this, but outwardly, you know, international space agencies have been, at least on the outside to what the public sees, have we been working along Russian cosmonauts without too much controversy since really 1998, but since 2000 continuously aboard the ISS. So have you been able to glean what the Russian attitude towards continue ISS operations and participation is? Yeah, of course. No, I have actually. I mean, what I what, what comes across um, is this. I mean, officially, as we know, there was this terrible moment after the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 when all hell broke loose on the Russian side. The guy that was running Roscosmos was a man called Dmitry Rogozin. Rogozin was appointed the head of Roscosmos in 2018. He was a larger-than-life character. He was more right-wing, if that's possible, than Putin. He was a founder member of a very right-wing nationalist Russian party called Rodina. He was given to making Hitler salutes. He was already sanctioned by the West in 2014 for his enthusiastic uh, support of the annexation, so-called, of the Crimea. And he was a brusque, difficult, blustering man given to very angry tweets. And the first tweet that he made, literally within hours of the invasion, after Biden had stood up and said, announce sanctions against the Russian aerospace industry, was to say that he was going to crash the International Space Station. Wow. Um, and what he meant by that was that the Russians, as part of the original deal going back to the 1990s that I talked about before, the know-how that they brought to the table was essentially propulsion, which also brings fuel to it, and attitude control. Those are the things they brought. The propulsion is critical because the space station's orbit is continually decaying. And so in order to keep it in orbit, roughly at an altitude of about 400 kilometers, you have to keep boosting it up from time to time. And the Russians provide the boosting power to do it. The Americans don't really have it. They have something they could use, but it's not really, it doesn't work properly and it's not advanced enough. It's never been there. It's always been the Russians that provide that. And that always worked very well under the old system. And this guy was threatening to pull the plug on that and say, you know what, we're going to crash this thing. We're going to crash a 500 ton. It weighs on earth twice the Statue of Liberty, two statues of Liberty. We're going to crash this thing on earth. It's crazy. I mean, yeah. unworkable. And he was just unbelievably provocative. And the provocations kept going and going and going. There were terrible moments when some cosmonauts actually posed with flags of the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. There were issues to do with spacewalks where they had victory banners, uh, which were, were happening at the same time as Ukraine was being invaded on the ground. There were all sorts of things that were happening that were very provocative indeed. And one of the things to pick up your point, Emily, is that they had talked about exiting the space station at that point in 2024. That's when they were going to leave. Okay. Space station was due to be decommissioned at the end of the decade. There were six years. How the hell were the West that can't provide the propulsion, don't have the systems to get the attitude control working properly, or don't have them yet? How are they going to keep the space station afloat in orbit? So all of this was going on, and it was getting worse and worse and worse. But after the Luhansk incident, the selfies with the flags, NASA, which had tried to keep a really cool head, exploded in a very NASA way. And they issued a press statement, which was incredibly measured and constrained, but was between the lines 
a warning shot over the bows. Like, don't politicize the space station. It is the one area which is outside politics. We don't do politics in the space station. And they sent this, they lobbed this shell across effectively at the Russians. And the next thing that happened was that Rogozin was fired mm. by Putin, interestingly, fired. And he was replaced by a man called Borisov, who is this colorless, wonderfully boring man that no one knows very much about <laughs> at all. And yet everything starts to come back to a more even keel. And the guy that was running the human spaceflight section of Roscosmos is Sergei Krikalev, who's the same guy I talked about before, who was stuck up in Mir back in 1991, hugely admired and respected cosmonaut. And suddenly people were able on both sides to do business with each other. And things got back to more of an even keel. The Russians this year said they were going to keep going until certainly 2028. The chances are probably very high that they'll keep going until 2030, around which point the International Space Station will be deorbited, which means it'll crash somewhere like an ocean, and that will be the end of this extraordinary era. But it was very severely tested in those first few months after the invasion by Rogozin, who incidentally was injured by a Ukrainian shell rather badly that exploded at a party on his 59th birthday in December 2022. Wow. Damn. And very recently, as I mentioned, I think in my piece, um, has been questioning whether Apollo landings ever even happened. <laughs> so he's now subscribing to the kind of fake moon landing conspiracy theory. So that's regression for you. Uh, someone's got to keep those uh, those things going, haven't they? Just just one quick one on uh, a brief follow up. This comes from uh, this comes from John Wisenhunt, one of our Patreon subscribers. He says, even every time we think, and this this carries on with what you're saying. Every time we think that the current ISS relationship is going to fold, it just seems to carry on. Do you think we might finally reach a political breakup, and could that happen before the hardware is decommissioned? Okay, great question. I think the thing is. The way the space station was always, the International Space Station was always kind of legally governed. I mean, the legal complexities we don't need to go into, but the key thing about it is it's run by something called the, I think, the Intergovernmental Association or IGA. What it basically means is that you can't kick anybody else off the station, right? You can't kick the Russians off. We hate the Russians. Kick them off. You can't do it. They have to kick themselves off or you can kick yourself off. And <laughs> to do that, you have to give a year's notice. Okay. Right. So- Let's just be very clear. In terms of the legalities for the moment, right? What would have to happen? If Putin started lobbing nuclear missiles, who knows what's going to happen at that point? But I know from talking to the director of the International Space Station at NASA, Robin Gayton, she told me that they have contingency plans. And the contingency plan would be basically to get the Americans off the station. That's what she was implying. She didn't state that absolutely. But she was implying they can get them off the station pretty damn quickly if they have to. Yeah. So something like that would possibly happen. An intermediate position and one that one quite famous astronaut and former ISS commander Terry Verts was telling me, he's, he's probably the most outspoken opponent of the International Space Station Corporation that there is out there at the moment. Him and maybe Scott Kelly as well, you know, Scott and Mark Kelly, the two Kellys. He said to me that what we shouldn't have are Americans going up on Russian ships and Russians going up on American ships. So what happens is there's a seat swapping arrangement that takes place. As you probably know, I'm sure your listeners will probably know, at least the space shuttle demise in 2011 meant that only way you could get up to the International Space Station was on Russian Soyuz vehicles. Then after SpaceX's Crew Dragon came in in 2020, Americans could suddenly get up themselves without having to go up on Sawyer's ships. But in 2021, it was decided, it was actually finalized to make sure there would always be a Russian going up on an American SpaceX Crew Dragon ship, and there would always be an American going up on a Sawyer's. And that's because it comes back to this idea that you've got these two systems that are integrated and you need a Russian to do the Russian stuff and you need an American to do the American stuff. Otherwise, you can't function up there. You can't work the space station. You're literally conjoined. You're like stuck in this marriage and you can't get out, even mm. if you want to. You could argue it's like a bad marriage, but you're 
you're stuck there. You have to keep going. The seat swapping ratio is absolutely critical. But there is an argument that people like Terry Wirtz makes, which is let's give that up. Who cares if we have a period of time, if one of the ships isn't working properly and we've got to wait three more months, if we don't have an American presence up there or vice versa. We should not be sending Americans to Russia to train or they shouldn't be sending Russians to us. And he did say to me, and I have to say, this is something I didn't put in the article, and he did say to me, as indeed did Scott Kelly, and both of these guys should know, and indeed so did Charles Bolden, the ex-head of NASA, said to me that it's really tough for those NASA personnel in Moscow. It's tough. They're confined for the most part to Star City, which is a kind of a compound to the north of uh, the training compound, to the north of Moscow. They are being monitored closely. They are separated from their families. Their families do not go with them. They're on their own for quite long periods at a time. And there are no one's willing to give me a figure, but it's something up to about 30 of them are living in Moscow. American personnel in the middle of this war are living there under very difficult, challenging conditions in order to be the NASA backup in Moscow for American astronauts going up on Soyuz vehicles. Terry Vert says that should stop. We should mm. stop doing that. We mustn't go on doing that. But as far as I can tell, when I ask these questions of key people in NASA, that's not going to change. It hasn't changed with the most recent vehicles that went up in August and September. And it's going to continue the seat swapping arrangement through into the Saturday to the spring of next year. So obviously uh, there's a lack of goodwill with Russia right now because of the war in Ukraine and some of the statements they've made about that. In the last few months, it's looked like Russia has tried to make a Hail Mary move equal to Artemis, perhaps even, you know, equal to the, the Indian lunar lander and rover that um, was launched. But this Russian moon mission failed very publicly. It did. So do you think like the lack of goodwill has affected Russia's space program? And is there any positive future outlook for Russia's space program. And obviously with some of the incidents that have happened on the ISS in the last couple of years or so as well, leakages and things like that, is it likely to improve or is there maybe a more positive outlook? I mentioned before how Dmitry Rogozhin, the head of Roscosmos, was fired very quickly after that incident with the flags. Why was he fired? Several commentators said to me the reason why he was fired was because he was dragging the Russian space program into the dirt. It was going one way, which was down. And the really big issue here is that the International Space Station is the only human space program the Russians actually have. In other words, they can bluster, they can talk, they can say, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the other, but this is it. If they pull out under that intergovernmental agency agreement, or if Rogozhin made, had made enough noises to bring them out, they have nothing. It's gone. And the combination of the loss of that human space program and the problems that you've just been identifying, the lunar probe that very publicly you said went wrong. Why did it go wrong? Did it go wrong because it sanctioned the biting? Did it go wrong because of the brain drain out of Russia? Did it go wrong because of sabotage? Did it go wrong because actually the Europeans have been very involved with the Luna program and they pulled out of that program completely. So suddenly the Russians were on their own. I mean, bear in mind that when it comes to the International Space Station and the Soyuz guidance systems that were used to poise and to position the Soyuz capsules as they travel to the space station, all of those systems were made in Ukraine. There is a massive amount of the Russian space industry that isn't Russian. It's Ukrainian. It's yeah. a really fascinating aspect to this. So all of that is gone. And they've got to suddenly devise all their own systems. So things are going wrong. The money is running out. And it's not always just that it's running out. It's even more interesting than that. It's being diverted towards missile programs. The Russians are very excited about anti-satellite missiles right now. They blew one up just before the war started. 
back in 2021 called Cosmos 1408. They blew it up and they nearly killed their own guys in the International Space Station as a result of the debris field that was created and still goes on to threaten the International Space Station. So all the guys on board, all of them had to take to, as it were, the lifeboats, which were their own spaceships on board, as this debris came screaming round. I mean, you just need George Clooney in there. I mean, it's one of those moments. <laughs> and so that's where they're putting their money. The money's going, it's not that there's no money. The money's going into weaponry. It's going into missiles. It's going into Star Wars type stuff. It's moving away from peaceful, civilian-based, if you like, cooperation-based space programs. So do they have a future, to ask your basic question? The reality is, after the ISS is over, they don't have a human space program. They've talked for ages about their own space station. There's no evidence that it's ever going to happen, or if it does, it could take years. The last module that they added to the International Space Station, which was called NAUCA, took nearly 20 years to get off the ground. And even when it got up there, it caused tremendous problems. There was this terrible computer glitch and it pulled the space station into a spin when it was up there. And that's just two years ago. Mm. So the technology isn't great, to say the very least. Have they got Mars? Have they got the moon? We've seen what's happened with the moon. Perhaps they think their best bet is China. But the reality is the Chinese aren't, don't need the Russians. And it means that the Russians are always going to be bit players to the Chinese. In fact, the Chinese space station, Heavenly Palace, Tiangong, the space station that's up there, its orbital inclination is such that Russian rockets cannot reach it. So the only way oh my God. that Russian cosmos <laughs> could get to the Chinese space station is by traveling aboard Chinese rockets. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is when I wrote that book, the story I was telling was of something really amazing. Russia got there first in 1961. It was a source of the greatest possible pride. And frankly, risks though there were, and they were huge, it was one hell of an achievement. It really was. Spool forward 60 years. And what have you got? You've got a dying industry. You've got no human space program to speak of. You've got no coordination. You've got a lack of money. You've got defunct equipment. You've got, as I saw in 2019, wild dogs running around the space cosmodrome at Baikonur, I mean, literally running around the, I mean, I saw them running around some of the launch pads. I mean, it's, it's, it's like that. I saw the assembly building, the main assembly building at Baikonur with its roof that had caved in and it had been caved in for decades and they hadn't actually had the money to mend it. It's pathetic. I mean, literally sad. This once great tradition, this once fantastic, stellar brilliant, inventive, innovative program is dying on its feet. And the war is the last chapter in that. It has been doing that for some time, but the war and Putin's war has essentially, it's the straw that's breaking the camel's back. And the sadness that you pointed out before, Dave, which is absolutely right, the sadness that you see in the eyes of these people on both sides, actually, on the American side as well, even if one uses the word side, which I don't really want to use, is a sadness that, that this great nation's tradition has been shattered. I mean, yeah. well and truly shattered. And I don't think, to answer your question finally, that it can recover from that. I'm about to start crying from that. That's such a devastating post-mortem. Absolutely. I think the way that you linked beyond there to your answer and, your, and those early days of of space flight and the success of the Soviet Union, is it any coincidence that when they were at the peak of their powers, it was being run by a Ukrainian? Yeah, well, there you go. Gross job. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's incredible. And that's one of the reasons why there was so much of it was in Ukraine. I mean, it's not entirely, and I'll probably get absolutely, God knows what, speared for saying that. But there is an interesting thing here. There's also another interesting parallel that I might want to point out. In the 1960s, Russia lost its way. The Soviet Union lost its way also in the space program. 
I mean, you had this incredible moment with Yuri Gagarin. Then you had Titov doing these many orbits of the Earth very shortly after. And all of this was happening before John Glenn had managed to orbit the Earth at all, which I think he did in February 1962, okay? The Russians were way ahead at that point. And their technology was, in many ways, really quite advanced and really quite extraordinary, even if the risks they took were, were substantially larger than the risks that the Americans were willing to take. Just a different kind of culture and a much more public culture in America, obviously. You're much more accountable. But the fact is that the Russian space program lost its way against Apollo, which was a very coordinated program. You go from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo. It kind of made sense. And the people who put those programs together were really thinking well, and they really did something which was utterly extraordinary, which was to go from, you know, the 15 minute flight of Alan Shepard in May, 1961 to, you know, the giant leap for mankind in July, 1969. That is an incredible achievement by any standards. The Russians went to pieces in that time too. They were concentrating on all the wrong things. They were concentrating on space spectaculars. The first woman in space, the first two man ship in space, the first two ships in space, the first three, the first four, the first whatever, the first spacewalk. It was all like that. And that's partly because there were political seismic upheavals because our Ukrainian friend Khrushchev was ousted in a coup by Brezhnev, but also because the guy that ran the space program, Sergei Korolev, died in 1966 yep. in an operation that was horribly botched, conducted by the Minister of Health. He was also Ukrainian. Yeah. What is interesting is that right now we're not in a dissimilar situation. The Russian space program has actually lost its way. And what it tries to do occasionally, but not nearly as well, are spectaculars. The most obvious of which was the movie called The Challenge that was made yeah. just before the war actually started. Now, I don't know if your listeners will know about this, but there was because it hasn't been advertised very much here in the West. But the Russians decided to make a movie in space, which is not a documentary, a full on drama that was shot in space. The movie was directed by a man called Klim Shepenko, and it starred a very famous uh, Russian actress, or actor, I should say. And they flew to the International Space Station towards the end of 2021. They were up there for about 11 or 12 days, and they filmed in space. Where did they film in space? On that capsule that I mentioned, on that segment, that module, Nyoka, that went horribly wrong two or three months earlier. There have been people that have said to me that the reason why Nauka, even after 20 years of development, was pushed into the International Space Station before it was ready was because there was Russian mafia money that was trying to get this oh, thing wow. up there in order for this movie to be made <sighs> wow. because it would look good for the Russians to get the first feature film ever in space. There was some talk at the time about Tom Cruise doing a movie in space. There were some quite advanced conversations ah. happening about that, but the Russians have to get there first. That sounds like all that stuff back in the 60s. So it does. true or not about the market, you get basically a not ready <laughs> module that nearly causes a major accident on the International Space Station imperiling potentially the lives of seven people on board, including Russians, when the thing goes into a spin so that they can get crews up to film on board three months later and tell the world they got there first. Where's this going? And indeed, I have to say, Sergei Krikalev, the man we've mentioned several times in the course of this discussion, was dead against that movie. Mm. What are we doing this for? But Rogozhin thought it was brilliant. What a great idea. It's one up against Americans. We're going to have the first Russian movie and Tom Cruise can go to hell and be second, just like Alan Shepard was in 1961. I love that. I love that dynamic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Right. And finally, it's been great to have you back on. It's been a while since we last spoke to you. Beyond won the Space Hipsters Book Prize for book released in 2021, which is wonderful. So briefly, what, what are your plans now? Are there any future space projects coming up or anything to do with Beyond that we might want to know about? I don't think for Beyond on space projects because I feel, I mean, that territory, I feel I've kind of done that territory for the moment. I mean, the book, as I think I mentioned to you, um, you know, before we started recording is being published actually now in eight foreign languages. And also 
I think I did mention this to you before. We got a bit more advanced with this now. We are now on the second draft of the script for a television series based wow. on that book as well. So about that, I can't really say very much at the moment, but the second draft is literally due to arrive on my laptop this week. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and it's interesting to read. And I mean, I've obviously got past the first draft. So I'm working very closely with the writer and with a production company, who a very, very good production company that are developing uh, the TV series for Beyond. So that's happening. That's quite a big part of my time at the moment. I have another book project, which I'm working on, which I can't really talk about <laughs> I, because you'd be the very first to publicly. <laughs> and much as I love being on this podcast, I haven't told anybody this. So this is a kind of a, you know, this oh, is still we understand. Underwrap. This is <laughs> under wraps, but that's something that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Um, so I'm doing that. And also I read a book a few years before Beyond about the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. That's also being developed as a TV series as well. So I'm working kind of hard and closely on, on that one too. So it's, it's all a bit kind of crazy busy at the moment. Space wise, I mean, I was really excited to write this piece and very flattered that the Guardian wanted me to do that. And I did wonder whether there was something bigger in all of it. But the reason I don't want to tell it in a book is because in a way it's a slightly depressing story. I mean, it's a story that is moving and powerful, but it's an ending in a way, or certainly mm. the ending of a long chapter. And one of the things I loved about writing Beyond was it's kind of exhilarating. You know, it's the beginning of everything. Absolutely, so yeah. It's a birth, effectively. So unless I can find that in the space world, I might put the space stuff slightly on hold. I'm not saying for any anywhere because I love the space world and I love because I've got all these connections with that world. Um, so certainly not. It's but it, I certainly for that in the next book it's it's shelved and then we'll see. Well, thank you for joining us. This really has been yes. wonderful. As I'll keep saying, everyone needs to read Beyond and everyone needs to read this article oh, yeah. as well. I think the article is really wonderful. So uh, we'll make sure people know all about that. But thank you very, very much for joining us once again, Stephen. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again. Always fun to talk to you guys. Always. Coming at you faster than Skylar falling down on Australia. This is the Space and Things podcast. God, I love having Stephen on. Isn't he just wonderful? I know. I, <sighs> he's incredible and he's just such a fount of knowledge. Like when we wanted to discuss this, because we really did want to do an episode where we discuss current Russian American relations in space, because there's the historic ones like Apollo Soyuz and Shuttle Mir and stuff like that. But in light of what has been happening with Russia in the last 18 months or so, you know, we, we kind of wanted to do an episode discussing this. And there's nobody that knows more about this topic. I think, you know, than, than Steven. So having him on the show is incredible. If there is someone that knows more, I'm sure there is, but they won't be able to tell it in the way that he tells a story either. I think that's what yeah. is not just his knowledge, Agreed. it's the way he tells a story and the way he can bring you in, I think is, is what makes him such a compelling guest. Uh, you know, there's just a few yes. sound bites, few things. He's like, which almost immediately, he had me going. He had tingles on my going down my spine. Went yeah, almost immediately, same. and there was one of, one of the big things was the big question. You know, what is space for? And that just got me thinking straight away. Yeah, like, yes. oh god, yeah, such a big big thing. And the, and the yeah. ISS is a beacon of hope. It really is. So having a conversation around the ISS has to be essential if you're going ever going to have the conversation. What is traveling to space for and all about? and uh, I, I loved how he talked about that there is a wonderful conflict within this story against the hope of the ISS and what it is for against the idea that it's all going so wrong with with Russia obviously their internal politics yeah. aren't anything that we would approve of at all in in what they in what they're doing to, in Ukraine and in other other stories as well it's just not right and the the idea of the russian space program becoming a disappearing story it's again as a quote to quote stephen there it's a disappearing story and when you think of the highs that the soviet union had in space for that again there's that conflict of do we want to be celebrating Soviet successes? Well, if you if we're just talking about spaceflight, then then yes, those successes are huge and worth saying. Wow, look what they did sixty years ago, fifty years yeah. ago. Yeah, you know, they were doing some incredible things, taking huge risks. And the fact that that story is is coming to an end, there is a sadness to that, even if yeah. even if it's 
self-inflicted, even if it's something that is as a result of a horrible thing that's their doing. You know, there's still a sadness. Yeah. You can still feel a sadness for that. And I think it creates a great conflict within yourself when you're even talking about it. You know, how should you feel about this yeah. and and what they're doing? And, and Stephen really gets to the grips of that within this article and how he just spoke to us there as well. Exactly. To me, and I'm sure a few people will take issue with the way I'm describing this, but it's like almost watching like a friend, an old friend, self-destruct yeah. or something like that. Because... I love learning about Soviet and Russian spaceflight. There's still a lot I don't know about it. I have a ton of books on it. It it just it's incredible to me because the West knew so little about it until really the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And there was a time, you know, that we were pretty enthusiastic collaborators. There was a time where things were a little different, obviously, in that we, you know, we were closely collaborating, working together. I think for the betterment of humanity and to me, this whole story is just a tragedy. It is a tragedy because it's it just shows you how one person with an agenda can just destroy everything, including an industry, including an industry, a whole freaking industry, you know? I mean, because when Stephen was discussing basically how Russia has nothing, their space program has nothing to look forward to. We can criticize NASA as much as we want. We can criticize Elon as much as much as much <laughs> as much as we want but they're still moving forward with things yeah. there's still things to look forward to we got artemis we got starship we got other programs that we could say wow that's something that i might not see it for a few years but when i do see it it's gonna be really cool and russia doesn't have that at all i mean it is just a tragedy from a country that offered so many i mean i know some of them were spectacular some of them were you know one off hey we did this first you know and but still, I mean, they have meaning to me. You know, Russia still sp sent the first woman in space, even though it wasn't to show women can do stuff in space. It still matters. It still was something that was different. Russia sent the first human in space. Russia sent the first satellite in space. These are still milestones that matter to me. I still love learning about their programs. I won't try to mention America's first space station, but they really pioneered uh, space stations. They really did during the 70s. They were sending up a lot of space stations and people were going to space for longer and longer periods. And we really sort of had the, I mean, we had our first space station and then there was a long, long, long pause between that, you know, and us doing that again. So we sort of had to learn how to do that from them, if that makes sense. To me, this whole thing is just yeah. tragic. It, it just is. It's a huge loss. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. what I'm saying is going to irk some people, and but I really love their program. I, I love reading about it. I think it's amazing to learn about, and I feel like it's going to be a thing of the past. Yeah, you know, I feel like 20 years, 30 years, if I'm lucky to be sitting here, hopefully. I'm going to be reading about it and thinking, well, that's something that happened back then. They're not well, doing well, that well, anymore. Well, maybe not, because you know we don't know. We can't predict the future, yeah. and there will be life after Putin. Exactly. So. Uh, you have a point, and I sure hope so. It, it may turn itself around, but the current evidence doesn't doesn't look that way. But I think yeah. I think for me that the, the the real sadness comes from the fact. Well, obviously, the real sadness is with the people of Ukraine and what is being done to the people of Ukraine. But Emily and I are clearly focusing on the space light terms of things here. Um, but neither of us are overlooking the people of Ukraine clearly. We're coming up to the 25th anniversary of the ISS, which is what we're talking about today. And the 25th anniversary of the first piece of the ISS being launched into space. And that was a Russian piece. And that, that collaboration, yeah. which has seen people in space since, well, for over 20 years continuously, is because of a collaboration. And as, as I pointed out, the Russian cosmonaut that was interviewed within Stephen's article had that element of sadness about the fact that when, when you work together, it doesn't that just show what we could be doing on the ground? And I think that's been the, that, that should be the legacy of the ISS. And I hope it doesn't all end up being for now. It, it would be such a waste if, if we can't end up taking some of that hope and actually 
sprinkling it on the planet and not just leaving it up in space or not just having it burn up in the atmosphere as it comes back and all the hope of what has existed up there disappear as soon as that does get deorbited. Agreed. Anyway. Right on. <laughs> I agree totally. A really great interview there. And of course, we'll share Stephen's social media pages within the show notes, along with a link to the article he wrote for The Guardian. The show notes can be found on spaceandthingspodcast.com or by looking in the show description of this episode in your podcast provider. I'll also be posting a bonus question and a full unedited interview within our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash spaceandthings. Also, it's uh, time for our book prize, which we'll be doing after we've done this episode. So if you're a Patreon member, the October book draw is happening and will be up on the Patreon this week. And of course, if you've not read Stephen's book beyond uh you really need to add it to your christmas list or sign up to patreon and you might win it this podcast flies on the generosity of our members to help out you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash space and things so emily what caught your eye in space flight since last week this has a lot to do with the interview that we've done this week and this headline is from ars technica for the third time in a year russian hardware on the space station is leaking Jasmine Mogbelli, who is one of the NASA astronauts aboard the ISS, who is a flight engineer, uh, looked out out of one of the windows on the ISS on Monday, yesterday, we're taping on Tuesday, and saw that there was snow in space. Now, obviously, (laughs) we all know that it does not snow in space. What these really were, were flurries uh, coming from Nayuka, which uh, is the science module, the newer science module aboard the International Space Station that was docked there, I think, in 2021. Some of you may remember when Nayuka was docked to the ISS, there were many problems with it, one of which that I think is very prominent was uh, one of the thrusters got stuck and the space station actually got out of orientation. It's actually fairly terrifying. I I can't imagine what it must have been like aboard the ISS at the time, knowing this is going on, and it To my knowledge and to my recollection, it took quite a while for them to fix it. So this is the third time a coolant leak has happened, I think, in a year. So you would figure it was something older having the issue, but no, it's Nayuka, which is a newer issue. And that brings, and we talked about this during our interview, but that brings up a lot of different questions. You know, um, was this thing ever ready to go to space in the first place? Was this a stunt to get it up there? I don't know if I even want to say this out loud because it frankly gives me chills up my arms. Is was this is this sabotage? Yeah. And I hate speculating that because that sounds like something from the six million dollar man. It sounds like something crazy from a TV show. Unfortunately, yeah. these are things worth I'm thinking about now, given the current geopolitical situation. Any thoughts, Dave? Well, I just think I agree with what Stephen Walker's one of Stephen Walker's thought processes was it it went up too soon because they just wanted to tell Tom yep. Cruise to uh get screwed. <laughs> Go F yeah. off. Yeah, it's a family show. I can't say it. I'm sure there are many people who have similar feelings uh, and would also like to do that. So um but you know the the Rus- Russians yeah. had a had a way of doing it. So why not? <laughs> If I if I had yeah. a way of telling Tom Cruise to stuff it, would I use it? Prop. I mean, I I probably wouldn't. No, I'm bigger than that. Sure, surely. I mean, he's only small after all. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he's about a foot shorter than you. I mean, I hate to I say it. I think he's almost but... two foot. I think he's almost two feet smaller than me. But anyway, yeah, he's about my size, yeah. roughly. So bless yeah, him. He, bless him. <laughs> he's not a big guy, but still, I I don't know. It's just it, it's crazy to me. So anyway. Dave, what has caught your eye this week? Uh, A couple of things. Firstly, the California Science Center are receiving a delivery this week of two solid rocket motors for their their piece of flight hardware that were were good to go for space shuttles uh, flights, and they're going to be on display eventually alongside the Space Shuttle Endeavour, which is going to be set up in launch configuration in the next couple of years, which is so exciting. And they've closed down one of the streets to, to... deliver these uh, solid rocket motors. So hopefully we're going to get some great photos of that over the next couple of days. Maybe by the time this podcast is out, people will have seen that. I have an apology to make. Last week, we talked about the Psyche mission, which is going to be launched hopefully today, 
as this podcast comes out on the 12th of October. And I called it the psych mission. I th- I prefer the psych mission, but... Uh, I like psych. I think Chris Bain... I like the psych. Chris Bain pointed out that it probably should be called psyche and everyone else is calling it psyche. But psych! I like psych. So um, anyway... Psych. Yeah, I like psych. Hopefully that's gone off and NASA is launching that on top of a Falcon Heavy, which is always fun. Uh, so hopefully, again, as you're listening to this, if it hasn't happened yet, quickly tune in to the SpaceX broadcast and, and watch that Falcon Heavy put that in space, which will always be fun. And the, the one yeah. that's really caught my eye this week, which is really fun, is that Prada have teamed up with Axiom to help them design their moon suits for Artemis. And I just love that story. I just think it's wonderful. And I think it shows where the future is going to go in terms of all the big corporations that are already big are going to be trying to find ways to get involved with spaceflight over the next few years. I think it. I think it's oh, yeah. inevitable. Anyone who's got a brand is going to want that brand associated with spaceflight. And of course, there's a, another aspect to this as well. The space industry really actually needs to reach out to other industries. Yeah. Apparently, there is a huge skill shortage within the space sector and a huge number of job vacancies. And part of the problem is that most people assume that the only jobs going are for scientists, engineers, or your pilots, astronauts. So these kind of collaborations hopefully open people's eyes a little bit. People in textiles or fashion... Are they the same thing? Who knows? Anyway, they may now realise that they have skills which can be used in the space sector and start perhaps looking for jobs there. Uh, Plus, having different perspectives brought in to help design or solve problems is also a good idea. And I'll talk about that more next week. Anyway, Prada being brought in for spacesuits or space accessories makes more sense than you think. I want a Prada McDivitt purse. That's what I want. That has the logo on it, the Prada logo. I would carry that around like, yeah, look, I got a McDivitt purse and it got Prada on it. And it's like scented or something like that. I don't know. I want that. I want, When that drops, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save up my money yeah. to get it because it's probably going to be like, it'll probably be like 10 grand or something. So, yeah. yeah. I'll save up my pennies to go get it. I don't it. know. I think, I think the Apollo PPK bags, the personal preference kit bags, were something special. I mean, they were very plain, white, plain, but I like them. Yeah, they're just plain white bags. I mean, I've got a replica that I bought from... Uh, I like them. ...from Lunar Replicas, which I really love, and I it's part of my gig bag. But anyway, that's what's caught my eye, and links to all these stories will be in the show notes. Please leave us a review or share our podcast with your space flight loving friends. This is Space and Things Podcast. That's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Believe it or not, as I said earlier, I'm back on holiday for a couple of weeks. We've got two fantastic episodes for you while I'm away. Also, I've started working on how to redesign the website and I've added a search bar into our archives. So it should now be easier for you to find subjects that interest you if you're new here. I'm also working on arranging them by topic, but give me a few months to get that finished. Also, we should have a new range of t-shirts available in the next couple of months. So keep your eyes peeled for those as well. Also, a big shout out to Jessica. We finally got a genuine Australian accent to do our stings. One of our patrons. If you're a patron and you want to do some stings, let me know and we'll have a chat about it. And if you have a moment, why don't you go and leave us a review on your podcast platform? Things like that really help us with the algorithm. So it's very much appreciated. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Thank you for listening. New episodes every Thursday. This has been the Space and Things Podcast.